because some of those things were based on stocks and some of them weren't. Again, gold could uh, use, uh, you know, arrangers that were hired just as arrangers, you know, namely, uh, especially Bill Chalice, who, who Vince knew. So uh, let's just talk about stocks first, and then we'll talk about Chalice. So stocks in relation to the Gene Gold Kid Library. I mean, just Josh should be here talking about more of this. I, I, I did some study on, I believe, uh, their arrangement of um, My Pretty Girl. The introduction was based on the Frank Skinner stock arrangement. Thank goodness. And I always love when you find these, these miraculous discoveries because to listen to an old 78, whether it's on an LP or CD or the original 78 itself, to try to lift those notes, it's awfully hard. You know, as much as those recordings are great, they're they're hard to transcribe. You, you have surface noise and the fidelity is sometimes not the best, but when you find a, a wonderful 78 RPM and then you find the same music that they're playing here in, in written form, it sure makes it a lot easier to uh, to, to bring this out. So the introduction for that, I believe, uh, I'm, I'm looking over Four Leaf Clover, uh, was, was, was based on the stock arrangement. And uh, I remember Bill Chalice telling me that they used elements of Clementine from New Orleans, but I don't see much of that. You know, sometimes over the years, the memories get a little foggy and uh, guys remember this and that. So uh, for the most part, I think uh, what Gold Kid was using was uh, was Chalice arrangements, Harvey Quicksell, Don Murray. Um, he pretty much used what they call specials. This is on your... Hey, you go. Yeah. Oh, right. Excellent. Man, we're, we're in living stereo now. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, say something about, you know, because I was there last night. Josh will be playing with his band here today. But Josh Duffy played last night at the Cole Ballroom, and I, you know, I had that same experience. When you hear those arrangements live, no matter how many times you've heard the record, you it, you always hear things that you don't hear on the record. Yeah. And by the way, I, I think the person, uh, you know, what's his name, the, the guy from Holland? Frank Van Dus. Yeah, Frank Van Dus. Frank Van Dus right, uh, is amazing at uh, transcribing this stuff. I think he's really, you know. Because I've tried to transcribe some of these things, and I hear Frank's version, I think, oh yeah, that's right. I should have done that. You know, uh, I was hearing that in Clementine uh, last night. So, uh, so at any rate, uh, tell tell us about your uh, relationship with you know your experience with uh, Bill Chalice. Chalice. Well, I got involved in this music very early on, about 52 years ago, when I was five years old with an old phonograph recordings that uh, my grandmother had. And uh, growing up in, in the 1950s, uh, with rock and roll coming in, I always was going back to this music. And uh, I got involved with a, a book in my junior high school days called Jazz the New York Scene by Lenny Kunstead and Sam Charters. And they mentioned uh, Bill Chalice's name quite a few times in this book, and they mentioned the name, the, or they mentioned the, the fact that he was an arranger. And you know, a lot of people don't really know who, who an arranger, who an arranger is, or what an arranger does. And I, and Bill said that many times that the arranger really is probably the most unknown person in the music business, but probably one of the most important people because he or she takes this raw tune and piece of sheet music either from the publisher or from a composer and has to work magic with it. Sometimes uh, some of these arrangers like Bill Chalice and Fletcher Henderson would take what they call dog tunes. I mean these tunes were just awful and they made masterpieces out of them like beautiful introductions and modulations and little spots for people to play solos on and um, so they they were they were important people and uh, featured the vocalists and, and certain backgrounds and keys. Anyway, I joined the union uh, when I was 13 years old, and just one day, grass going through the directory, I see uh, a listing on the arranger of a William H. Chalice in Massapequa, Long Island, and I was living in Smithtown, Long Island, which is out in the right middle of nowhere, out in Long Island. And uh, I wrote him a letter and I said, uh, I'm a young tuba player and very much a fan of uh, the music of the 1920s, the music of Gene Goldkid and Paul Whiteman. I wonder if you're the same person who did these arrangements and if you would consider 
uh, a student. And he writes me back. And uh, this, I was too afraid to call him, you know, because I was this young kid, 14, 15 years old. And uh, of course, I couldn't get there. My dad used to have to drive me there for our Saturday morning lessons. He agreed. And um, uh, part of the uh, great things with studying with Bill was, uh, was after the lesson, we'd, 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 we'd talk to about everyone and everything. And I got a lot of insights about the musicians that he worked with and the singers and, and uh, some of the Sharpies and some of the, the press, you know, and, and a lot of people that have contacted him over the years, particularly asking him about Bix. And he was very, very protective about Bix and, and he felt bad sometimes about some of the, you know, things that they said about Bix, the drinking and all that stuff. And he was, he was reluctant to talk about that. He says, I was afraid to, you know, you talk about one thing, you get misquoted, and then things get blown out of proportion. But I'm, I'm just telling you everything I, I, I knew about Bill Charles. Bill uh, was very headstrong about learning this musical system of notation called Schillinger. Schillinger was a Russian fellow that came to the States in the late 20s, early 30s, who devised the system with math and music. And we worked with graph paper. And oh boy, this was really hard. It, uh, it, uh, it was sort of like uh, going back to uh, my high school studies with uh, ge uh, trigonometry and algebra. And all. I didn't get it, and I gotta say, I never got it. And, and, I, and I've never used it. And I've never used the Schillinger method that Bill taught me. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was kind of a, you know, an unfortunate experience. But he said that in the same room that he was taking these lessons, there was George Gershwin, you know, who was taking this system because Gershwin felt he was repeating himself. There was Ferdy Grofay, there was Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller's theme song of um, Moonlight Serenade is really a Schillinger exercise. Da, dee, 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 dee. So anyway, we I get through the Schillinger with Bill, and then we talk about Picks and Eddie Lang and the Dorseys and on and on. Uh, yeah, the Schillinger system was kind of a fad there for a while, in yeah. fact, uh, and there were schools all over, and, and the Berkeley School of Music, which was the first school devoted to jazz, you know, in Boston, that still exists, uh, started out as the Schillinger School originally, and converted to Berkeley Jazz School. Um, but, I mean, did he, did he ever get into the nuts and bolts of, of, of just arranging them, you know, and orchestrating? Did he ever... Unfortunately, no. You know, that's that's what I really, because I, I brought manuscript paper, and uh, just as a sideline here, uh, one of the other perks of meeting with Bill on Saturday morning was the presence of Chauncey Morehouse. Chauncey and Bill had been friends since the 20s, and uh, and one day I came by, and they brought me up to the piano and said, hey, kid, listen to this. And there they were. There was Bill and Chauncey at the piano playing four hands. And they were playing this, like this boogie woogie kind of beat thing. I said, gee, what is this? It's just a new tune we just wrote called Swamp Buggy. And it's, and it's going to be a rock and roll hit. And I said, you're a young kid. What do you know about rock and roll? I said, oh, gee whiz. I don't know anything about rock and roll. That's why I'm here with you. Let's talk about Bix and Frankie Charma. <laughs> it, was, it was a weird juxtaposition. I said, you know, these two gentlemen in their 70s getting into rock and roll of those sorts, you know. So what, I mean, just briefly, what, uh, can you give us a little capsule history of, of what Chalice did after, you know, he was with Gold Cat then, and, yes. and what happened after that? Well, after the King of Jazz uh, film, uh, it was a tremendous bomb. You know, it really didn't go over. The, the, the depression was on, and uh, the, uh, the taste in music, you know, newer bands were coming up. Like Ted, things were changing. Ted Williams at Casalona. So Whiteman cut his staff and he let a lot of guys go. And Bill was one of the guys he'd have let go.